month ago that I'm going to become an emeritta, I believe I'm called. Um, and uh, I wanted to tell you, uh, remind you that our fourth session on work life uh, is going to be 11.30 Tuesday, November 13th in the SIS Founders Room. Again, we will serve lunch. Um, and this one really appeals uh, to me particularly as we go over, you know, beyond uh, money, beyond healthcare, um, and Andy and I, Andy Rowe, and I really talked about, you know, what about your life? You know, what about your well-being? And it's something that I think about a lot. I shared at the first session <clears throat> that my dad, when he retired from the company that he built over the course of 40 years, he died almost exactly a year and a half later. And I remember him saying to me um, when he did retire, how am I going to still feel relevant? And I was thinking about that uh, last week when I walked across campus and all these students that I've taught over the course literally of um, many, many years, particularly recently, in recent years, are graduating and they give me a hug and, oh, Professor Krasno, it's so great to see you. And I thought of the affirmation uh, that comes from being part of a community and from knowing so many of you. And so how will I feel relevant? Uh, the good news is I do believe, don't quit your day job until you have another job. And so um, one of the things we're going to be discussing fully, and we want you to think about hard, is what's your next step going to look like? Do you need to make an artery of um, cash? When you leave, uh, I do. I'm married to an architect, not a Trump, uh, thankfully, sorry. Um, and uh, so, you know, I know that I have to make a certain amount of money uh, and have planned uh, and planning for that. Um, are there dreams unfulfilled in your lives? Have you started a novel that you haven't continued on for the last 20 years because you've been everything to everybody and you've had a packed academic schedule. So we're really going to talk about that uh, with um, Dale Rampel, right, who's our uh, social worker who works with American University. Uh, it's not going to be a shrink session, so it's not going to replace that. But it will be a session which really to go beyond uh, the benefits th uh, of money and health care into, into what your futures look like. So maybe talk to your partners, talk to yourselves uh, about what you might want the next step to be like. And in sharing information, um, we can certainly empower each other. Another thing I just wanted <clears throat> to mention that we are going to do at next session, we're going to ask all of you, so all of you who've come to four sessions, and some of you have only come to two or three and um, may want to repeat, we want you also to think about how we can stay connected as a community. You might not need to come to a healthcare or a TIA session, but you might want to do other things as we move forward in uh, thinking about retirement or actually um, get going the next step. <clears throat> I just want to end with saying that even if you're five years away or um, 10 years away, I just met somebody very young. I think she's less than half my age. Um, and, you know, it's just never too early to think about <clears throat> what, you know, what it, 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 I call it resurrecting childhood passions. You know, who did you want to be when you were 20 that you didn't get to be when you're now 50 or 60? And that, that's, that's a very exciting uh, dream to have and to fulfill. So we're really looking forward to our fourth session. There's a sheet on your tables that's called Retire Well. If you haven't uh, filled out your Retire Well sheet, uh, please do so. It is my pleasure now to introduce Joselino, and uh, he will take it from here. So have fun, uh, retire well, and we'll see you next week. Good morning, everyone. So thank you for coming here today to the Retire Well session. I'm going to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, the first one is Hank Conway. Hank uh, works with TIA. And then Darren Reed, 
I'm going to start with Hank first, uh, since he's going to start the first part of the presentation today. Um, Hank Conway is a director in the institutional business of TIAA, a Fortune 100 financial services organization, and leading provider of asset management and retirement services for the academic, research, medical, and cultural fields. Hank has been in the financial services for over 30 years and has been with TIA since July of 2007. He manages the financial consulting team, which serves over 140 institutional clients and their participants in the state of Maryland, DC, and Northern Virginia. Hank holds a BS in business administration from American University and an MBA <laughs> from George Washington University. He holds uh, FINRA series 7, 66, and 24 registrations while maintaining life, health, and variable annuity licenses uh, from the states of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and the District of Columbia. So without further ado, um, Hank Conway. Well, <clears throat> good, uh, let's see here. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. Um, so um, Professor Krasno kind of nailed it. I always like to, to start out with uh, a question for you all. You may have heard it before, but how many folks here intend to retire? All right, you got your hand down. I'm worried about you. So, um, so she, she mentioned a couple of things that I think are really important. You know, Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said as one of those seven habits, begin with the end in mind. And from a retirement perspective, that's critical. Begin with that end in mind. What does retirement mean to you? I'm going to show you a bunch of statistics and some strategies up here this, this morning. But really, unless you have a goal, unless you know where you want to be, it's kind of hard to build that pathway to get there, isn't it? So make sure you understand what retirement means to you. And that comes in a lot of different flavors. Um, retirement is not a single event. For many of you, it may last 20, 30, 40 years. You know, the average mortality for men is kind of early 80s. Women is kind of mid-80s now, and that's average. So your likelihood of living longer than that is pretty high. And in fact, in, in academic institutions, and I'll always say that it's because you're a TI member, or Fidelity would say you're always a Fidelity member, my buddy Darren over here, um, you live on average at least five years longer than the actuarial tables say you would. So really, you're going to have a long retirement, and you're going to have multiple stages through retirement. So as you plan retirement and go, gee, when I retire, I'm going to go cycle to Tour de France. Well, maybe you want to do that early in your retirement when you're really healthy rather than later in retirement when you might not be. So plan for different levels of capacity in retirement. It's not a single event. It's a stage. It's, it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and then the other most important factor is always plan it with your partner, spouse. They may have a different idea of what retirement is. And that's something you probably need to understand really early on rather than at the last moment going, oh, gee, I want to live in the mountains or I want to live at the beach. Um, but plan it together with them. Now, if you're fairly young, you know, I see a lot of young people out here. Write down the retirement goals and what you're going to do and plan it out. And look at it every year because it's going to change. Life's going to change for you. The world will change. Events will change. Update it every year so you always know what that goal is. Because if you set a goal 20 years, you know, 20 years ago, it's probably different than the goal you would set today. A lot of things have happened in the world with you, maybe. And sometimes, you know, I said it's a continuum in retirement. Um, looking at your partner may determine what you can do. I know my, my wife and I took a trip recently to, uh, to Glacier National Park. And I'm in shape. It's round, <laughs> but I'm in shape. But she's in better shape. So we went hiking, and I hiked around the lake and saw a lot of wildlife and a lot of 
you know, beautiful scenery, took some great pictures, and she hiked up the mountains and saw the glaciers and lots of great views and all that. We were both happy. We had a great time. But we both knew what we could do. So plan with your spouse. You all have to do that together. Um, so once you have that goal, though, you have to build a roadmap how to get there. And that's one of the things I'm going to be concentrating on today, um, a retirement checkup here. Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So we're going to... All right, so this deck is for about an hour and a half. <laughs> so I'm going to go through some things pretty quickly. But two-thirds of baby boomers plan to work past age 65 or not retire at all. I don't know how that works. Um, you all have some wonderful benefits here at American University. Your retirement plan is very rich compared to people who are in the private sector and many who are in higher ed. So you have the great opportunity to truly accumulate some wealth to apply towards your retirement. One third of boomers expect Social Security to be their primary source of retirement income. That's really sad. Social Security was never established to be the primary retirement for people. It was always a supplemental plan. You all know you're sitting in this room because you know you have to do more than that. So you've got competitive needs, though. Right? There's, there's more than one hand trying to reach into your pocket for your money. And you have to prioritize them. So you have to make sure you, know, you have a house where you're going to live. One of the goals, one of the key, key determinants of success in retirement, though, is paying off your house by the time you retire. So you don't have that mortgage note sitting over your head. In the D.C. metro area, if you plan to stay here in retirement, housing is very expensive, right? So you could have a very expensive housing note. If you can pay it off in advance, you're much better off. You still have to, even if you have, have it paid off, still have to do maintenance on the house and all those kinds of things. And if you're saving for a house, hopefully everyone here is, it is at a stage where you've got your own home now or your living arrangements are very comfortable and, and manageable. But if you're saving to buy a house, your retirement still has to come first in many ways. Kids and education. Okay, so you got some good benefits here. Um, one of the things I always tell people is that if you are sacrificing your retirement to put your kids through school, and I know that's a touchy subject for you all because you, that's what you do, right? You believe firmly, and I do too, that everyone should have an opportunity for a great education. But if you sacrifice your retirement to put your kids through college, what are you telling them? You're telling them that they just became your retirement. And when you retire, you're moving in with them. <laughs> right? And it's probably not what you want to do. And it's probably definitely not what they want you to do. So there are lots of options for kids to pay for college. Your retirement's not one of them. Okay? All right. Elder care. You've heard of the sandwich generation, right? You take care of your kids. And you got to take care of maybe your parents, who weren't quite as prudent as maybe you are. And you're in that in-between, and how do you balance that out? A tough discussion, a really tough discussion. But you do the best you can and still do your best not to create a situation where you don't have a retirement out of it. Um, there's a lot of help from an elder care standpoint. That's another discussion for another day, um, but certainly a discussion that you need to have if you're in that situation. You can't bury your head in the sand. So if you know, if you have a parent, sibling, someone you're, you know you're going to be responsible for at some point, you need to make plans to be able to handle that. All right, health care. This is scary. I don't mean to scare you guys, but... 65-year-old couple looking to retire to cover all your health care expenses in retirement, $288,000, according to a cer certain survey. So now, is that happen all, is that all, you know, paced out through your retirement? You know, $20,000 a year? No, it isn't. The bulk of your, 90% of your, your health care expenses come in the last couple of years of, of life. Okay, now, there are certainly 
individual exceptions and, and so on. I mean, this, these are generalities. But healthcare expenses are very, very important. And the, if you can manage them now for the future, you'll be so much better off. So, aside from those items being there, just existing, they get more expensive over time, right? So houses, this is a 10-year average, go up about 20%. College education's been going up a little bit. Elder care costs have been going up quite a bit. And retirement health care has gone up a lot in the last few years especially. So you have to be aware, 288000 today might be a bigger number in the future for you. Are you guys scared yet? No. <laughs> All right. Um, so are you on track? And this is really establishing an income floor. Understanding what are the basic needs at retirement, not today, but at retirement, that you have to have to be able to make things work for yourself. Not taking lots of trips, not doing all those wonderful things that you plan to do on retirement. We'll get there on that. But what are the basic needs just to keep things going for you? And you need to do a budget to do that. You always need to do a budget today anyway just to see where your money goes. And sometimes you surprise yourself. I had a good friend who he did a budget. I encouraged him to because he was always complaining about he didn't have enough money, he couldn't save enough and all that. And I said, well, do, do a budget. See where's your money, where your money's going. And he did, and he found out he was spending like 400 bucks a month on Starbucks. And I asked him, what are you doing about that? And he said, well, I'm buying a coffee maker, and I'm putting the other 300 bucks in my savings account. So just know where your money's going. But then do that budget in retirement. And it's going to be different for each one of you, right? Some of you are going to stay here. Some of you will say, gee, my kids, you know, they moved to New York. So I got to go live in New York now. <laughs> That's going to be even more expensive. Or, gee, they moved down to Florida and I want to be close to them and, and I can buy a place there for half what it costs here. Look at where you're going to live. Look at what you're going to do. Do a budget. Some things will go away from what you're doing today, but then you'll be adding things in. Gee, I want to join the golf court club and, and pick up that, that hobby. Not a cheap hobby, right? So what you want to do is Set your retirement income goal. So I said, get, you know, understand what your goal is in retirement, but you got to put a dollar sign with it, right? And the dollar sign will be different year by year. So for the first few years, it might be fairly high because you're active and you're doing things, and you're taking trips and you're climbing mountains and you're riding the Tour de France and all that. But then later on, it might be less because you're not doing all those things. You're enjoying a good movie instead or maybe a good, good dinner with friends and all that. But you're not out there spending a lot of money on trips and so on. Now, healthcare expenses may have gone up a little bit. It's a balance, right? So do multiple budgets as you go through. But you want to see what that, that goal is from a dollar standpoint and then see what your income levels are to see if you're, you need to review your plans. Can I really do that in retirement? Can I afford to do it? Or I can do more things because I'm well above that goal. Let's see here. Darren, if you could just give me a high sign when I'm, when I'm about 30 minutes in so we can give, give some room if you don't mind. I'll do the same for you. So what we did was we created what we call our asset salary ratio, or ASR. This is a way to kind of predict if you're on track. It's a, it's a gross way, and by gross I don't mean ugly, but it's, it's a, a generic way to do it you individually will probably be a little bit differently because you know what your situation is better than we do. But based on the number of years to retirement that you got, so this person is, say, 20 years away from retirement, they need to save to replace 80% of their income about 4.5 times. They should have 4.5 times of their income saved up at that point. So if you're making 50000 a year, just to pick a number, they need about four and a half times that. So what's that, 225,000? Hey, my undergraduate degree's paying off. But that gives you an idea of what you need to save up 
what you need to have today at your savings rate to say, gee, I can replace 80% of my income. Okay? Does that make sense? Sort of? That's, a, that's what we consider a good average. Certainly there are years where we've had you know, double-digit returns. Certainly there are years where we haven't. Six percent is a decent average. I'm sorry? Yeah, well, what we wanted you to do is kind of write your questions down, um, and then we'll take them at the end, if you don't mind. All right, so we're going to go through. So. To replace 90% of your income, if you say, gee, I do have to move up to New York because the kids are there and that's where I want to be. It's going to be more expensive. I've got to replace more of my income. The number is higher, as you would expect. So that person at 20 years doesn't need 45 They need 5.6% of their, of their income saved today. So if you're looking at, gee, I'm at 10 years, 10 years out, if you've got that multiple saved up, you're in good shape. If you've got less than that, you probably need to work at it. And there are only three things you can do. Save more, retire later, or be more aggressive in your investing. Okay. Now, you want to be careful with that last one as you get closer and closer to year zero when you're going to retire. Okay. Because you obviously don't want to be putting a lot of money at risk when you're getting ready to pull the trigger on retirement. You want to be preserving your assets at that point, so you need to be careful. All right, income floor. I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago. This is the basic amount that you need to be able to maintain your household to live your life. So, you know, you need to calculate that out. You need to see if you, your income hits that number, and if it doesn't, we need to make adjustments. All right, so this is, a, this is normally a deck where we have a workshop and, and we have everybody going through certain activities, but this is an activity I encourage you to do at home. Remember I said you need to do a budget today. Go through that budget and set a savings goal for yourself. Gee, I want to be able to save X amount out of my, what I'm currently spending today. How could I do it? If I had to do it, what would I cut back? Prioritize things. Now, if you're still already saving, you're already in good shape and all that, you don't have to do those things. But at least you ought to have an idea in your mind. If I had to cut back, what would that be? Okay. So where do you get your retirement income? Your retirement plan here, right? It's going to be probably your primary source of retirement income. You're going to have Social Security in there. Darren's going to talk about that in a minute. If you worked elsewhere, maybe you had a defined benefit plan, a pension plan, as they would call it. Maybe you worked for the federal government or some other, other company. That's a great place as well. You may have an outside IRA that you've been saving up in, either a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. You may have an annuity, and you may have an annuity within your retirement plan. Um, you may have just mutual funds that you saved up out there. You may say, gee, it's great, you know, I'm going to retire, but I'm going to work a little bit in retirement. I'm still active. I still have things to do. I, I still have, you know, the, the good, good professor. Where, where are you? Um, oh, she took off. <laughs> That's right. She had a class to teach, right? She's got to go help some students. But she says she's going to write some books. She already does write books, but she's going to write more. So she's going to continue to do things in retirement, but more things she wants to do than things she has to do. But she's going to have an income from that. And that's a great way to supplement your retirement income if you are a bit behind. Okay? And then you may have other assets. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's a huge transfer of wealth going on right now from, from boomers on down, and you may be somewhat of a beneficiary of some of that as well as the generation prior to, to yours, ours, continues to pass on. Um, but lots of sources of, of income and retirement. One of the things I encourage you all to do is also just, every state has a unclaimed property kind of website out there, unclaimed money. 
go out and look for it. You may be surprised that uh, there may be some money that the state is holding for you that's been sheeted to them because you had an old bank account you forgot about and you had a couple hundred bucks left in that. Or Actually, I went out in my case, I, I sold a house and bought another house and, and somehow or other the escrow money or the money they'd been escrowing for property taxes never made its way back to me and it was being held by the state of Virginia. And so I got a nice little check for a few thousand dollars. So you never know, it, it could be there, go out, take a look. There may be some found money. Um, again, the, the plan here, I'm not gonna go into details on the plan here. You have the ability to meet with Fidelity reps, TIA reps, plus HR. You should have a pretty good idea what the plan here looks like at this point in time. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of that. There are a number of vehicles out there. At this point, you should be pretty well set as far as the individual types of, of vehicles you're using to save for retirement. Um, but if you want to know what else you can do, if you say, gee, I reached a stage in my life where I can save a lot more, I can do more with my money, sit down with your TIA rep, sit down with your Fidelity rep, we can help you with that. Um, you're at a great research institution here. You might also have some online research that you can do and look at things. Um, I can go through IRAs and so on, but I'm not going to do all of that at this point. Um, annuities are one way, and there's a strategy that, that we use a lot with folks. <clears throat> Remember I said the income floor, what the basic things that you need to live on. Well, very often when you look at retirement, one strategy is to say, gee, I've got income coming in from Social Security. That's X amount. I need, pick a number, $5,000 a month to live on. Between my spouse and I, we've got 3,000 coming in from Social Security. And that's stable, that should continue. If you are over 50, you probably, whatever they do to Social Security to continue to shore it up, you're grandfathered in for the most part. If you're younger than that, it may affect you. Um, so that's something you always have to watch as time goes by. But that may provide 3,000 of that income. You say, gee, I need another two. Well, maybe annuitizing some of your money provides that number two and then you've got uh, the rest of your money out there to pay for trips and do all the other things that you want to do. So that's one strategy among many. Again, what's perfect for you is going to be something that's going to be very individual and that's why we always recommend you sit down with a consultant here. Um, there's some myths about annuities and, and we do like to dispel them. One is that You'll see in, within the, at least the TIA world, uh, annuities, many people go, well, it's an annuity. I got to annuitize everything when I retire, right? No, you can take it out. Sometimes, depending on the, the, whatever you're in, there may be, you may have to take it out in chunks, but you can take it out. But again, Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. If you're trying to provide a personal pension for yourself, that annuity may be a great thing for you. Um, I'm, again, I could go into lots of detail here. Darren, are we, are we about to, uh, time? Yep. Okay. Let me just go ahead. Uh, mutual funds, Social Security, we've covered all of this. Um, I would say the best thing you can do is not delay if you're, if you're looking at things. Sit down with your consultant here. Make sure you're on track. Use the online tools. Fidelity and TI both have great tools online where you can go in yourself and estimate whether or not you're on track. Use them, please. Use the consultants that come by here. Um, if you find you're behind, start saving more right away. If you haven't started, start saving more right away. Um, but um, let's go ahead and just take questions at this point and uh, see where we are, and then I'll hand the microphone over to Darren, and he can go through Social Security. So any questions from the group? Ma'am, I think you had one. Way back in the back? Uh, oh, 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 okay. Yeah, she, she just mentioned that, that the projection that we did that was based on a 6% return and whether that was good or bad. And my response to her was basically that's kind of an industry standard that we shoot for at this point. So, yes, ma'am.
Yes. So there's a lot of talk about there. Uh, putting money in, which hopefully we've done, uh, but how does it work about pulling it out? I hear that uh, TIA <coughs> assigns you a particular person that you deal with or to we pull can. money it, out? It, that's why I say sit down with a consultant here, TIA or Fidelity or both, if you're using both of us, um, and we'll work with you to build that strategy on withdrawing your funds in retirement. The best thing you can do to help that along is to have that goal and have a retirement budget because then that gives us the road, the, the idea of where you want to be and we can help you then build that roadmap. But typically it's a combination of, of some type of annuity very often so that you have that personal pension that covers your income floor and then money on top of that to help you do what you care to do uh, as the, the kind of variable part of your life. Other questions? Oh, come on. I can't, be, can't have been that comprehensive. To go back to your floor illustration with $5,000 a month moving. Hey, hang on. Oh, back to your floor illustration with $5,000 needed and a, a couple getting 3000 from Social Security. You're saying that the annuitized portion would be 2000 a month and then you'd use the extra chunk for fun travel and variable expenses. Yep. Yeah. Others? All right, Darren. All right. Social Security. You're too young for this one. <laughs> um, Darren, excuse me. Yes. If I may, I'm going to oh, um, just sorry. introduce Darren, just a brief introduction. Um, Um, Darren Reed um, is a, a Fidelity retirement planner. Uh, he has been with Fidelity for eight years. He has over 17 years of industry experience and is a chartered retirement planning counselor, <coughs> investment advisor representative, registered securities representative, and licensed insurance representative. Darren holds a bachelor's degree in health science and policy from the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. Uh, so without further ado, I'll leave you with Darren. Good morning, or afternoon, I guess. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for inviting Fidelity to be part of this. Thank you to the benefits team, uh, participants of the American University. You all are great partners in, in hope that not only we provide a, a, a message that is useful and compelling for you, but also a resource for you if you need to, to leverage us uh, for planning. Um, you know, the introductions, you, you see that? So, so Hank gets five minutes worth of introductions, director of the financial services universe, licensed A to Z. And we got a guy from Fidelity who also is a black belt in Taekwondo. But, um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I have been, uh, you know, in, in the industry for, for some time. So I've worked with a number of pre-retirees and retirees and helping them to uh, plan for whatever their goals and objectives are at retirement. And, and Hank brought up a really good point, right? So you have to be able to visualize and understand what that is and then develop a, a strategy or plan to get there. And sometimes there's some hard questions that you got to, you, you got to ask yourself. Um, you know, is, is this going to happen? Do I need to work longer? Do I need to save more? Do I need to adjust what those expectations are? So we're going to talk about one of the components of income planning, and that's Social Security. So um, how many of you uh, are scuba divers, open water divers? Anyone in the crowd? Wow, what do you guys do for fun? <laughs> so um, how many of you are familiar with Jacques Cousteau? Right? All right, so, so many of you. So he's a French explorer, um, marine, maritime con conservationist, uh, open water diver, one of the developers of the Aqualung. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Aqualung is the apparatus that allows you to breathe underwater. So upon the development of this, this apparatus, it allowed us to go underwater and experience this, this wonderful new world, right? So, so Jacques and his team were able to document and um, you know, photograph, film you know, th this new, new realm, underwater world, aquatic life. Just imagine if while he was underwater with his team and they were so enthralled with what they were watching, 
that they didn't check their levels to see how much oxygen they had, right? That principle in itself is, is planning. It's financial planning, making sure you have what you need to be able to achieve your goals and survive the essentials. So again, Social Security, we'll, we'll do uh, you know, a kind of a basic overview of the program. There are hundreds uh, of different strategies. The folks down at the administration go through rigorous training. Uh, so I would say one of the takeaways from this is to leverage them. Use their website, call them as a resource schedule time to sit down with them to identify you know, what strategies you should be considering. So we'll, we'll talk about how you generate income. Uh, we'll talk about the, the key consideration, uh, some of the key considerations, one of them being health care. So uh, Hank, in addition to a number of other slides where he stole my thunder, one of them was that, that health care slide that, that we'll talk about later, uh, and then uh, how and when uh, to claim Social Security. So uh, generating income, what you're going to do at retirement essentially is replacing your paycheck. How do you do it? Some may have pension, Social Security, uh, you may continue to work, consult, royalties from writing. Uh, you may have rental property or investment property. Uh, but the key thing, and, and Hank touched on this as well, is creating a budget. So take an inventory of your income versus expenses. What are, what are those goals and how much is it going to cost you? Checking your financial readiness, that's just a fancy way of saying sitting down with a financial planner or advisor uh, and then continually monitoring that plan to see if you may uh, or may not need to make any adjustments. So when we think about retirement, we generally think about the good stuff. Anybody have like a, a really cool retirement goal? Like something that's really, really unique or special that they'd like to share? No, not really. We're just not going to do anything. Just sit and watch uh, Dr. Phil all day. All right, well, um, I've got one. What's it? What's it? Oh, interim election, just watch political news all day. Um, so. So I, uh, I reside in Maryland, and commuting here was not easy, right? As you can imagine, commuting anywhere in this area. So I'd like to not have to do that, not have to deal with uh, the beltway traffic. But you know, one of the really special goals, I, so many, many years ago, as an advisor um, in one of our Fidelity branches, I, I uh, had a client who was 75 years old and retired doctor, and he uh, decided that he wanted to do a Mount Everest base camp trek. So I thought, wow, that's really cool. He had to go through all of this you know, um, rigorous uh, testing just to make sure that he can endure that. But, but I think that would be something that's, that's really, really neat. So thinking, visualizing what that's going to be and, and you know, figuring out how you're going to get there, but maybe spending more time with family or doing something that, quite frankly, you're too busy to do now. Um, but we also want to factor in some of the not so good thoughts. Uh, Hank talked about the sandwich generation, right? So 50% of those who are mid-career are, are dealing with the responsibility of caring for an elderly parent or child. In addition to that, we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years a real increase in, in debt, right? So if, if we think about the statistics there, uh, we have a trillion dollars in consumer credit debt, 1.5 trillion in student loan debt, forty-four percent of Americans can't cover a thousand-dollar emergency. It's Twenty-nine percent of Americans over the age of fifty-five have no retirement savings, and sixty-five percent of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, making sure that that house is paid off by the time that you retire, you have a plan and identify when it will be paid off. And, and being able to manage your liabilities and your balance sheet. So five key risks to retirement, really only one of them you can control, and that's how you budget. That's how much you access your retirement savings. But longevity, people are living longer. Our statistics and it, from, a, from a study that we get from the Society of Actuaries suggest that you have a 20 to 25% chance of living to uh, 92 for men and 94 for women. Uh, Health-related costs, so we just talked about that being a, a very significant cost uh, later in life, and if there's a long-term care need, you can probably double that cost. Inflation, this is purchasing power risk, so watching your dollar erode in value over time. Inflation's been very tame for a long time, probably a good chunk of my life, 
Uh, but we're starting to see inflation rear its head. That's some of the headwinds that we've seen in the market now. Uh, we, we see a significant amount of inflation in energy-related costs and healthcare costs. Asset allocation, this basically is just a fancy way to describe managing risk within your portfolio. So, so being able to endure some of the volatility and having a strategy or plan to address that. So how much will healthcare uh, costs potentially be? Again, uh, as my, my colleague said, or my friend said here, uh, over a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, Long-term care, particularly in this area, will, will um, most likely double that. So in claiming Social Security, there's a number of factors. When are you going to claim it? At what age? How long do you expect to live? Um, your gender? Are you married? Uh, are you divorced? Uh, and will there be any other income that you'll be generating uh, while you claim or when you're considering claiming? So Social Security. How many of you have done any research and are familiar with the program a little bit? So a, a social uh, welfare and insurance program, it, it uh, is designed for all of us to contribute into a pool for retirees now. And at some point in time, when we all retire, we will be able to benefit from that uh, pool. Anyone um, familiar or know of the first recipient of Social Security? You've done any of that trivia? This is a good one for Thursday night trivia at the, at the local uh, watering hole. So uh, Ida Mae Fuller, Ida Mae Fuller, um, school teacher, retired school teacher out of the state of Vermont, was a classmate of Calvin Coolidge. Uh, she, her first uh, benefit, and she, she received check 00000000001 for $27.54. She uh, accumulated throughout her her uh, retiring years, probably about $23,000 worth of benefits. Guess how much she paid into it? She paid one year, $22, $22.54. So when I tell that story, people say, oh, that's what's wrong with the program. Well, really, it isn't, because the program's been around for 80 years, and it, it's not designed for you to create a retirement pool for yourself. right? You're creating a retirement pool that we're all contributing to, and when we retire, it's going to be our kids and our kids' kids that support us. So some interesting milestones here. 62 is when you, you can claim the benefit at its earliest. Uh, there, may be a there, there may be a 25 to 30% reduction in benefit. Uh, Medicare eligibility, so that happens at age 65. Full retirement age, we'll talk, we'll talk about the schedule. Uh, for that, but generally it's between ages 66 and 67. All FRA or full retirement age means that means you receive 100% of your Social Security benefit, and then at age 70, that's when you uh, can claim the maximum benefit allowable. Generally, it's 20, uh, 24 to 30% uh, more of your full uh, retirement benefit, and that occurs at age 70. So. Uh, what is FRA or a full retirement age? This is the schedule. So if you were born in 1960 or later, it's 67 uh, years of age. If you were born in 1955, it's 66 years and two months. So this is the schedule with one exception. If you were born on January 1, any, any uh, New Year's babies here? So you would just follow the, the schedule or, or the, uh, the rules for the previous year. So January 1, 1956, your full retirement age would be 66 years in two months. So how does the program work? Well, you got to qualify for it. You qualify based uh, by, by working for a covered employer, by earning enough credits, and by being age eligible. So working for a covered employer just means the institution that you work for redu uh, reduce your paycheck by, pay, by uh, Social Security tax, they pay a portion and you pay a portion. In terms of being eligible by credits, so one credit is, is equal to a minimum of uh, $1,130 per quarter. So to, to earn one credit, you have to have at least that much in wages for a quarter. So one quarter, they're four quarters a year. This just means you got to work for 10 years to receive 40 credits. Now, we'll talk a little later about 
how the, the Social Security Administration actually calculates that benefit. They base it on your 35 highest earning years, but this is the minimum requirement to be eligible for Social Security. <clears throat> and again, we, we talked about this age milestone earlier. You have to be at least 62. So calculating the benefit, claiming early versus delaying the benefit. There's that schedule again. You, you generate it or, or you qualify for a benefit based on your work record, based on your spouse's work record, or your ex-spouse's work record, or a deceased spouse's work record. So I'll say that again. It's based on your work record or a spouse's work record, whether it's current or ex-spouse or a deceased spouse's work record. To qualify for spousal benefits, you need to have attained age 62 your, the working spouse must have um, claimed the benefit and are receiving Social Security benefits. And again, to qualify for Medicare, uh, you must attain age 65. So in claiming spousal benefits, uh, again, the, the, uh, the worker must be claiming the benefit, must be taking the benefit at full retirement age. So this is full retirement age for you. Uh, is in, in, again, it falls back on that schedule, whether it's 66 in a few months or 67, you'd be eligible for 50% of their benefit. So the Social Security Administration gives you an option. It's 50% of the spousal, the, the spousal benefit or whatever you earn based on your own work record. So I have a slide here that kind of breaks that down. So let's say your spouse is PIA, that's primary insurance amount, that's what you're eligible for, 100% of the benefit at full retirement age. Let's say it's $800. So at your full retirement age, you're eligible for either 50% of that or whatever you're due based on your own work record. So in this example, 50% of your spouse's primary insurance amount is $400. If you were eligible for $250 based on your work record, what does it make sense to do? Claim spousal benefit. And so the Social Security, Social Security Administration will go through this calculation with you and give you your options, uh, but this is an example of how and why you would take and, or claim spousal benefit. You can also claim on an ex-spouse's work record. So. You know, I've, I've presented this before, and I heard rumblings in the crowd like, yeah, just give it to them one more time. Yeah, all right. Well, this doesn't affect their impact their benefit. This, this is just for your benefit. Um, ten years, you must have been married for ten years, not have remarried, so this is a good ra uh, rationale and argument just to shack up. Um, you're both eligible for Social Security benefits, and you have been divorced for at least two years. Clicking a little too fast here. All right. So estimating the Social Security benefit, again, again you can go to the website. They have a uh, quick calculation. In fact, with Fidelity's tools, uh, you can go online. We can do an estimate for you. I imagine TIA has something very similar. Uh, but they're looking at the average of your highest 35 earning years. So it is a fancy calculation where they try to determine what your AIME your average index monthly earnings are. But essentially what you're doing is they're looking at your high 35 years. The other thing that's going to impact that benefit is when you claim. So do, do you all uh, still receive statements in the mail? Anyone got a statement lately? So there was a time when they would, you, you do it online? So there was a time when they did it, and then they went away from doing it and encouraged everybody to go online. And so they now have gone back to sending out statements unless you've elected not to do that. Uh, it's really easy to access online, uh, so you can go to ssa.gov. But essentially, the, um, the benefit statement looks like this. And then it's going to lay out your, your earnings record or your, your work history. So this is an example of someone who may want to consider delaying Social Security and maybe working another year. And here's the reason why. Look over here at 2010. There, there are no earnings for that year. So this may be the year where you took off to take care of a spouse or a family member. Uh, and so this will impact the benefit that you're eligible for. 
So this is one of the reasons why you may want to say, uh, I'll work one more year. I'll wipe out this, this $0 earning year, and it can bring up your average index monthly earnings, which can impact your benefit. So, so the question is, and I'm going to answer this question. I know how this slideshow works, so there can, this can like cascade into a room full of raised hands. Um, but so, so would the Social Security Administration look at your high 35? Yes. So if you have 36 years and one of them is a $0 earning year, they're not going to look at that $0 earning year. I think, I think the point is uh, you want to identify what your earnings history looks like. And if there are low earning years, and, and forgive me for stepping in front of the slideshow here, but if there are low dollar earning years or zero dollar earning years, working one or two more years can have a positive impact on your Social Security benefit. So I think that's the point. Was, was that helpful? OK. See what I'm talking about? So there's another hand there. This is, so I'll take this one, and then let's, let's kind of hold off, because some of this stuff kind of gets a little um, complex. But yes, sir? 35 years ago, I was making Deutschmarks. <laughs> We're good. We don't have those anymore. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing it. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so deciding when to claim, how long, how long you may live. So your family history, uh, if you have long live people, if your mom is like 99 years old, uh, you may want to consider delaying that Social Security benefit to the maximum. Also, the impact on survivors. So if you're nearing retirement, 66, 67, 68, and your spouse is 50, and you earn more than your spouse, you may want to consider delaying that benefit so that they can inherit you know, a, a higher uh, Social Security amount. And, and lastly, your overall financial position. Uh, what's the cash flow look like? How much have you saved? All of that weighs into uh, when you may want to claim. But here's just a, a quick uh, a slide to help you uh, really process the, the benefit of delaying. So if, your max, if the, the uh, full retirement age for you is 67, that means you get 100% of the benefit, so you're eligible for $1,800. If you elect to retire early and just claim at 62, you, say, you see you get a bit of a haircut, so you give up some of that benefit. But if you were to delay just three more years, look, you get about $400 more a year, or roughly 5,000, I'm sorry, $400 more a month, or roughly $5,000 more a year. And if you expect to live another 20 to 25 years in retirement, that can be significant. We're going we're gonna, to, I'll come back to you at the end, sir. So I mentioned one of our tools that, that is available to you. It's, um, uh, when to, it's, it's fidelity.com forward slash when to claim SS. I'll give you that, that uh, link again at the end of the slideshow, but this is what it looks like, and it's going to ask you a series of questions. It's interactive, and then it will give you uh, a, a, some scenarios of, of whether or not you should uh, claim or when you should consider claiming. So if you're healthy, expect to live longer, you have enough cash, maybe you plan to, to hold off and take in the benefit until 70. And we've gone through kind of a calculation. This is just another example of the benefit of delaying. I, I said I was going to show this again, just if anybody needs to see it. These are the milestones, 62, full retirement age, or 70. So in review, it's, it's really important to develop this plan. You know, that story earlier, what, what my friend Hank here was talking about, you really have to assess what retirement looks like and then start to build the blocks to get there. Uh, so that's why budgeting is so important in identifying what your Social Security benefit may look like. And I would really say uh, leveraging Social Security, so going to ssa.gov. Uh, you can call one of our phone planners. They can talk to you uh, about um, developing a plan for retirement. We have a number of tools and resources. It's called our Planning and Guidance Center. That's on netbenefits.com. And that website, again, for uh, our uh, Social Security estimating tool 
is uh, fidelity.com forward slash wind to claim SS. So we flew through a lot of that material. Um, I would just ask, because I know we're, we're, you guys will probably have uh, a few questions. If it's something specific to your circumstance, just pull me, just you know, come, come uh, ask me after the slideshow. Uh, I'd be, I'm, I'll stick around for a while and be happy to address any of your personal financial planning concerns. Yes. Great question. The question was, how does working affect your benefit? How does working affect your benefit? So work, working part-time or, or working in general affect your benefit. Uh, so at 62, if you were to claim at 62, there is a concession. You would potentially forfeit some of that benefit if you made a certain above a certain income threshold. And I believe it's about $17,040, something like that. So if you made more than $17,000 in, in a given year, whatever your benefit would be at 62, you'd give up $1 for every $2 above that threshold. $1 for every $2 above that threshold, okay? In the year in which you turn full retirement age, so if that's 67 or if that's 66 in a few months, uh, you, the concession would be, and, and I think the income threshold is about $45,000, more or less. Uh, you'd give up $1 for every $3 above that threshold. And then in the month in which you turn your full retirement age, you give up nothing. So you keep it all. Is that helpful? Yes, it's claim, 70 is, is the maximum. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you get, you, you, so any, so if you claim the benefit in the year in, or, or the month in which you turn full retirement age or any time thereafter, you concede nothing. You keep all of your Social Security benefit. Now that benefit may be calculated into your combined income, so it may have a tax impact. Right but you do not give up anything. Is that better? Okay. Does everyone understand that? I, I got the number. So you said full retirement, you give up nothing. At 62, it's about 17 and 1, 72. And then yep. that other number, the 45. And the, in the year in which you turn full retirement age. So let's say you have your birthday is December 15th, whatever year, but that year you're turning uh, – 67. So in that particular year, you would concede $1 for $3 for every $3 earned above that thresh threshold, excuse me, it's approximately $45,000 until the month of December. And in the month of December, you keep it all. Got it? Everyone good at this table? Every, everyone else understand that? Great. Yes, ma'am. Come back to me. The number about um, the average uh, medical expenses for a couple in retirement is twenty two or twenty three hundred. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, about a quarter of a million to three hundred thousand. What about our total pension? Is that half that? I would say it's about approximately half that. Okay. Yes, sir. I had a slide where you had an estimated payment at sixty two, sixty six, and then or 60, full retirement age, 66 or whatever, 67, yeah. and then 70. What if you retire at full retirement age but do not claim Social Security until you're 70? In other words, delay claiming Social Security. Yeah. Will you still be able to get the maximum even though you haven't contributed for the last three years? Yes, yes. Okay. So there, there is still a, a, uh, a heightened benefit so what that looks like, it may it may be a, a, a value that's different from a statement that you a statement that you have received earlier, because the assumption is that you continue to work and, and contribute into the pool. But um, yeah, you, you'll get uh, you'll get a heightened benefit above what you ordinarily would receive at full retirement age. But in other words, what you're telling us is that it's better to work until you're 70 if you want to get the maximum, maximum, maximum. I, I mean, as a, as a financial planner, I'll say, because we look at things through a different lens, right? It's, it's about numbers, and it's about um, 
probability, and the probability is that you may live uh, a, a longer life in retirement. And so, yeah, I, we, there are benefits in delaying, till social, delaying Social Security uh, until the maximum age of 70. Uh, some of the considerations are if you, have, if you expect to live a long life, uh, if you have a younger spouse, or if you have a spouse that has earned significantly lesser than you that you want them to inherit uh, a, a, a higher or much larger uh, survivor Social Security benefit. But in other words, if you do work until 70, your retirement, uh, Social Security retirement income is higher. That's correct. I mean, in general, each year that you delay, it's, it's, it's about an 8% increase in benefit. That's, that's correct. But however, it, it, the benefit, if you were to retire at full retirement age and you still delayed till 70, you're going, you will receive a higher benefit at 70 than you had received, uh, than, than you would have received uh, at full retirement age at 66 or 67. I call the Social Security Administration, and, and they, they can kind of go through the actual formula with you. Uh, but, yeah, in general, you'll get a higher benefit by delaying. That, that's the, the message. Yes, sir. <laughs> if I work for the Social Security Administration, I would. It's, generally, it's, it's 8% each year that you delay, in general. So is that 8% of the income that you were incurring? Like, if you made... The I make forty. This person makes a hundred thousand. Is there a difference in the income amounts that Social Security gives you? No, no. We're talking about benefits now. We're talking yeah. about yeah, and your benefits. Yeah, like, say, if one person made a hundred thousand dollars a year and they worked that thirty-five points, yeah, is that considered about your income, or is it going by just the points? So, all right. So. Um, and this issue gets kind of complex, and that's why this is just kind of an overview. We don't get into the actual formula of the calculation in this slideshow. To answer your question, your, your income does impact the benefit, right, up until a maximum point. That there is a calculation to determine what your average index monthly earnings are, and that's what helps to determine the benefit. What we're now talking about is that benefit. Whatever it was that you were eligible for at full retirement age, for each year that you delay taking that benefit, you'll get kind of a pay bump. Got it? OK. All right. Yes, sir. So you have my, my benefit and then my, my benefit and then my spouse's benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, she and she, she's taking it based on my income because um, when I, if I pass away, what happens to her benefit? Does she only get that smaller number? It's a really good question, and, and that, that wasn't in my deck. I, I, I wanted to bring that up. So the survivor at, will inherit the higher of the two benefits. Okay. So one of those benefits is lost, but the survivor will inherit the higher of the two, which, again, back to my, my talking point about delaying to get a higher Social Security benefit, whether it, you're delaying and claiming at 68 or 69 or 70, can be useful to a surviving spouse who either earned less uh, or is much younger. Yes? Somebody how many times that I <laughs> If my spouse is collecting, is retired and is collecting Social Security benefits and I'm still working, that there was some kind of spousal benefit I should begin to collect even though I was not retired and I should start getting that money and do something with it to earn more money. Does that, and yeah. d does that make sense? Does yes. that sound good? Yes. Better? So so back to there's hundreds of different strategies. I. I, so I'm going to comment on I'm going to comment on this, but I, again I'm going to defer some of the, the specifics to those strategies to the Social Security Administration because they can talk to you about about what's allowable and what you should consider. You're, uh, what I believe you are referring to is is a, a strategy that's called file and suspend, which file and suspend, which would which which would allow which would allow your your spouse to claim delay 
then you to claim at full retirement age and get the spousal benefit, delay your benefit, and then claim your own benefit to get a much higher um, income amount. They don't allow that anymore. That, that's gone, they did away with that back in 2013, 2014? Yeah, it's been about four years. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. So uh, that was a good one. And, and we, we were talking to a lot of people about it until we weren't talking about it anymore. Um, but it, the Social Security Administration kind of got hip to that strategy. And, and uh, so, so that one is not allowable. There is, a, it, depending on your age, the, certain people are grandfathered in to, to possibly do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I call, I call the Social Security Administration to, to kind of figure out what you can do and what you can't. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have a it's, general. It's probably somewhere around sixteen, eight, eighteen hundred or so. Actually, I think it's it's lower than that. It's, it? it's like seven, eight hundred dollars. Okay. On average. Oh. Oh, do people live at retirement? Um, well, well, our our statistics suggest you got a twenty to twenty five percent chance of living to your mid nineties. I think I think average mortality is somewhere in your mid eighties. So if you're claiming at it, you know, at full retirement age, it's probably somewhere around twenty years, more or less. Along those lines, I once asked somebody who said, "Do you plan to live past eighty two? You you benefit from waiting, but if you." You know, I mean, they're they're kind of set up to basically break even. So they plan on the average person passing away at 82. And so yeah. if you start claiming early at 62, you get 18 years of, yes, a lower amount, but at least you're getting it. You could put it in a 6% return. And so this is not advice, by the way. No. Um, so this is just so, my perception. So, <laughs> we are being recorded here, people. Uh, so, so I think the break even from 62 to delaying to full retirement is probably about 74, 75. The the break even from delaying from full retirement, whether it's 66 in a few months or 67 to 70, is 82. So if you, if you plan to live beyond 82, I'd like to live beyond 82, but if you plan to live beyond 82, and my grandmother is like 95, so um, I'm probably going to hold off if I can, right? And, and the, the considerations are what's your cash flow? What are your other income sources? Is your spouse going to continue to work? What's your spousal, spouse's benefit? Will you have pension? How much have you saved? So all of these things kind of factor in, so it's not just cut and dry. We'll take one last question, and then we'll both stick around. If you have other questions, we'll, we'll uh, be happy to address them. Yes, sir. You said that your payment in Social Security is based on your earning over 35 years. The highest 35 earning years. That's correct. <laughs> what if you haven't worked less than 35 years? Great question. So if you've worked less than 35 years, they're going to take the average index monthly earnings of your earnings history which may include low earning years or zero dollar earning years. Okay? Thank you all for your time. We've enjoyed being here. I think there's still some snacks in the back and we'd be happy to address some questions.